DNS. Almost every company or project who was once focused on DNS is now focused on DNS plus security or may even have shifted completely towards security. Uh, and the reason is DNS is behind everything. Um, as you would see, once I have slides, uh, if the Internet were a territory, the DNS would be its map. Um, you can't find anything and you can't get anywhere unless DNS is working. Ow. <laughs> okay, we have power. That's it. Um, and as a result, it, uh, by looking at traces in DNS, you can often find out exactly how you got hacked and sometimes by whom you got hacked. Because uh, bad guys need DNS as much as good guys do. Uh, it's kind of a unifying field theory between the two communities. Um, so here I'll be speaking not so much about DNS and its security features, although I'll mention them briefly, uh, but DNS as it relates to security. It uh, creates a number of security problems, but it also creates some interesting security opportunities. So, briefly, because I think there might be one or two of you in here who is not an expert on DNS, I'm going to give you kind of a, a, a two-minute overview. Uh, Seth Breedbart has the best definition of the Internet that I've ever seen, uh, but it, also, it all talks about packets. And he's simply noting that if you're speaking the IP protocol and you're the largest, you're connected to the largest cluster of other things that speak the uh, Internet protocol, then you're on the Internet. But there are plenty of private internets, which we don't capitalize sometimes, and we spell it with a small letter I, internet. But in, in any case, his definition relies on packets, because the internet itself is ultimately just made of packets. Those packets all have IP addresses, um, and it is by those IP addresses that uh, a packet knows where it's going or when it's received that the receiver knows where it came from. So IP addresses are difficult, and they're getting more difficult to uh, write down on your business card. They're also uh, very temporary. You will, a service on the Internet might move around between a number of different IP addresses. And so even in the earliest days, we've been referring to Internet resources by their names. Um, and by doing that, we have created some overlays on top of the Internet. Uh, the web, for example, is an overlay on the Internet. And what's interesting to me is that DNS is also itself an overlay on the Internet. It uses IP to help other people use IP. So it's uh, recursively overlaid. Which might explain my fascination with it. Um, now you may think that domain names are going out of style because you're not seeing a domain name written on the side of every movie poster or every box of cereal in your house the way that you used to. Uh, and indeed, people are typing domain names into their browsers less than they used to do. Uh, and the web is the main driver of Internet traffic, and so it, you, you might take that evidence and say, that means the DNS is going out of style. Um, exactly the opposite is true. Because everything that you click on in your web browser, uh, the only reason you're able to click on it and then get the page that you were seeking is because the page it came from had a DNS pointer to the page you were going to. In other words, the web is linked together with DNS. And when you search for something, you are searching for something uh, by keywords or perhaps by some uh, collection of keywords, but ultimately, if you get any results, it's because the search engine was able to find those resources using DNS. And so what's happened is that although the user interface on the web is gradually improving so that we don't have to look at, at domain names anymore, uh, domain names themselves are more important and more plentiful than they have ever been. Now, I mentioned that the bad guys also use DNS. They have to. If they, if they want their resources to be accessible by their victims, there has to be a, a track in DNS for that. Um, and what's interesting about DNS uh, compared to Whois is that Whois can be false. It can be hidden behind Whois privacy. It can use junk addresses. Uh, junk zip codes. There's no reason that people have to put uh, any attribution information into the Whois records of a domain name they plan to use for crime. Uh, they, they can find ways to lie about it or to say nothing. 
Um, and there's not a lot we can do about that. On the other hand, you cannot lie to DNS. If a bad guy does not put the truth into DNS in terms of where the name servers are located and what the content is, then the crime cannot proceed. And so that's the big credibility gap between DNS, which we use a lot, and who is, which most of us don't depend on very much. Um, I would have loved to move into a Star Trek-like future where everything was clean and nobody was, there, there was no poverty, uh, disease, famine. Uh, we did not get there. We, we've moved into the internet age, coming out of the space age, and we took the criminals with us. Um, it would be great if we could leave them behind uh, trying to snatch purchase, purses from little old ladies that uh, increasingly had nothing in them because they were doing all of their, their transactions online. Instead, the bad guys noticed that the rest of us were moving into the Internet and said, wow, there's got to be a great opportunity for us. They were right, it is. They get better use out of the Internet than we do. Um, so if you look at the DNS economy, the way that domain names are used and created and bought and sold, you'll see an awful lot of optimizations which appear to have no real place except to accelerate crime. I'll get to that in a moment. But uh, let me just call your attention to the fact that domain names are now so cheap that no one worries about having one taken away from them. Um, and who is privacy is uh, commonly available. You can pay a lawyer somewhere to uh, represent you to your registrar. And unless somebody can get an actual subpoena or search warrant or something to the who is privacy operator, they will not be able to discover your identity. Uh, it's difficult for me to imagine what legitimate user of the Internet requires that feature. But just as Francis Bacon wrote that nature to be commanded must be obeyed, so it is that DNS to be commanded must be told the truth. And once uh, the truth telling begins, then the security stoppage can, can follow. So this is, uh, we're nearing the end of my brief tutorial about DNS as it relates to security. Uh, domain names are grouped into zones. So the com name that you think of as the com dom uh, domain is actually also a zone cut. There is a difference in authority between the root zone, which points to com, and the com zone, which contains com. That's, that's called a start of authority. And at every one of those start of authority cuts, you will find some name server records that tell what set of servers on the internet you should be referring to if you're looking for data that, is, that ends in this name. There's another zone cut below com at example.com. And at, at that zone cut, once again, the administration changes. So basically, who has the ability to insert records in com is a different party than who has the ability to insert records in example.com. So, these zones are the, the primary method of grouping records together, and that includes not only the operation of the DNS, but attribution, if you happen to be trying to use DNS as part of your forensics work. Um, so these zones have name servers. The name servers have addresses. I've shown one here. This is a real address for a real name server for, for the comm zone. Um, and, but, Name servers are not the only things that have addresses. If you look at www.apnic.net, that is nobody's name server, yet it has an address just as a name server would have. And finally, in order to understand the rest of my presentation, you must remember that IP addresses are blocked. They're, they're grouped into blocks. We call them net blocks or CIDR blocks. C-I-D-R is the uh, acronym that you'll see. It means classless interdomain inter routing. And, uh, I'm happy to talk more about that for anybody who's really, really bored. Uh, but anyway, uh, these address blocks can be um, of any size, as long as that size is a power of two. I've shown here two different address blocks. One is a block of uh, 256 adjacent addresses. That's two to the eighth power. Uh, one is a block of uh, 16 adjacent addresses. That's the slash 28. That's two to the fourth power. So all net blocks are a power of two in size. Okay, that's it. You can, you can uh, pay attention again. The, the, the geek stuff is over. Um, I mentioned DNS has some security features. I had a hand in creating some of these, and I can tell you that transaction signatures are very cool, but they're heavyweight. They're not something that you can afford to do billions or hundreds of billions of times per day the way that you would, uh, let's say, answer queries. That has to be a lightweight activity. 
uh, but for a relatively no low number of transactions where you're just doing updates to a zone or you're perhaps transferring the zone between a primary server and a secondary server, you can do this with transaction signatures so that a shared key lets you be sure that you're getting the right zone from the right place or that you're giving the, the zone to the right person. So it's used both for authenticity and access control. So strongly recommend that if you're not using TSIG, you should start. Um, DNSSEC is even more interesting because it secures data end to end. It allows a zone operator, such as VeriSign for .com, uh, to generate some keys, which they place at the top of their zone, and then use those keys to generate crypto-authentic signatures for all the contents of their zone. So you, when you receive an answer from the signed comm zone, and it is signed, uh, will receive a few signatures. And if you have configured yourself for validation, you can verify that the content you were given matches the signatures for the keys, etc., and therefore it really did come from VeriSign. This is important because so many intermediaries on the Internet uh, would like nothing better than to have you ask a question of a name ending in .com and receive an answer that is not real. The answer might point to a phishing server, might point to some other e-commerce man in the middle. There are, there are a lot of people who have the ability to inject bad data into the DNS. If you have DNSSEC signed zones and you have DNSSEC validation, that can't work. This, is, this stops those problems absolutely in their tracks. So again, if you're not signing your zones, please start. If you're not validating in your recursive name servers, please start. But that's the end of my treatment of DNS' zone security features, because what I want to tell you is how DNS creates security problems and opportunities. Um, as I do this, I'm going to be pointing back to this three-layer chart. The stub resolver at the bottom, that's your smartphone, your laptop, your desktop, your servers, your virtual servers. It is making queries of some trusted set of recursive name servers, probably named in your DHCP transaction, maybe assigned to you by your ISP or your enterprise LAN operator, or a lot of us still maintain Unix systems, and so there's a file at cresolve.conf that would list those servers. Uh, they have to be servers you trust, because uh, the, it, the DNSSEC thing that I just described happens between the middle and the top, uh, whereas between the middle and the bottom, you just have to presume trust. So uh, do not point your name servers to somebody who you don't drink beer or to either authority servers, which are the things on the top where the content comes from, or recursive servers, which are the things in the middle where the caching occurs and where actual end users are served. Uh, I have nothing to say about the end users today. Um, so in 30 minutes, there's only so much you can do. All right, we're almost there. What's great about these power failures, by the way, is that I can now run over time and no one can blame me. <laughs> well, once we get off the half hour mark, then Katie has no obligation to finish on the full hour mark either. So this is, uh, this is good for both of us. All right, so that's why I'm describing those three different layers. You'll see that I have a box off to the right called passive DNS sensors. Um, I'm going to recommend that you install one. I'm going to tell you why, and I'm going to tell you what the result of that would be. Uh, but the fact is, we're not the only ones doing it. Passive DNS is interesting uh, for some security-related reasons, but the thing to realize here is that I have been anti-surveillance much longer than Edward Snowden has been in the workforce, uh, which means that even before the NSA's misdeeds were made public to the world, I was already in the position of saying, look, I have a company that gathers data from all over the world and shares it and makes it available to uh, people who can do good with it. Some of them are commercial, some are military, some are academic, whatever. And none of that data has any PII. You see where I wrote PII down below? That's where the, the end user IP addresses uh, occur. That's where reuse events occur. Those are the transactions you would have to have a record of in order to use my data to launch an investigation. All you can do with the data that's above that, uh, that, that middle box is to enrich an investigation. So if anybody hears that uh, passive DNS is a uh, NSA plot to take, take away everybody's privacy and security, uh, point them my way. I will, I will set them straight. 
So, let's talk about some fun abuses of, of DNS. Uh, source address validation, SAV, was once described in an RFC, BCP 38, um, by Daniel Sini and Paul Ferguson. It's worth reading, it's very short, very simple, and it explains what's going on here, probably better than I'm about to do. Um, what, what's going on here is that the attacker at the top would like to bury the victim, who was on the left, with packets. And so that's a traditional DOS. They're, they're simply trying to overflow the victim's internet connection so that they can't get work done. Motivations for this could be political. They could be just a couple of teenage gamers who are tired of being killed by the other guys, so they start DOSing each other. They could be uh, DDoS for hire, where you're paid to DDoS somebody, you don't even know them, but you got the money, so you're sending the attack. It's fairly often done for ransom. If you have an online gambling uh, resource that will lose uh, measurably large amounts of money for every minute that it's down. You might DDoS somebody for 10 minutes and then give them the, the, the bank, the account number of a bank account in, in, in Switzerland. Uh, there are a lot of different reasons why you might want to do this, but they all use the same method because if you send a packet toward somebody that has a, a proper source IP address, and they did not solicit the packet, they can ultimately hire some security company who will uh, look at that stream of packets, find out where it came from, and call the ISP that they are coming from and say, hey, there's a DDoS coming from you and I would like you to stop it. And if you're the attacker and you're part of that ISP, then you're going to lose your connection and possibly uh, even face some kind of civil penalty like a lawsuit for um, uh, abuse of terms of service. So, any, so the re result is no one does that. Uh, because the internet does not require you to do that. Why would you out yourself if, if the internet's not going to require it? So uh, what they actually do is they transmit a stream of packets toward an intermediary. The attacker, in this case, is sending packets to the guy on the bottom, but the source IP address of those packets is the victim, which means that that reflector at the bottom is going to be sending responses to the victim. And so the victim will do the same thing. They'll hire a security company or they'll get a good security operations center and they'll say, hey, we're receiving packets that we didn't solicit. They will call the guy on the bottom and say, please stop DDoSing us. And the guy will say, all I'm doing is responding to questions you, you are asking me. And the guy might say, but I'm not asking you any questions. And they said, I can't tell they're not from you. Once it goes through that big cloud in the middle, it could legitimately be from you. I just see it as coming to me. Uh, okay, well, you have to stop. Well, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to firewall you out so that I stop answering legitimate questions from your network also? And that's when the guy on the left has to seriously do the trade-off. Would I like to be completely dark from this resources point of view, or would I like to just somehow survive? Do I just want to wait this out? Just maybe we should all go, for, go out for pizza and beer and hope that this attack is over. That's about all you can do. Those are your choices. They're bad choices. I don't like bad choices. So, um, on one of the days that I drank too much coffee and uh, looked for problems that made me angry, this was the one, and I found a, a uh, associate who was willing to work on this with me, and we came up with something called response rate limiting. And this is where you look at the requests that are coming into an authority server. Remember, that's the box on the top of my three-layer chart where the content comes from. You look at the queries coming into one of those servers, and you say, if I get a lot of repeated queries from the same net block for information that I've already sent them, in other words, they're asking me the same question over and over again, they're clearly not hearing my answer. They could be behind a firewall. A lot of people launch DNS queries from behind a firewall. Ask any root server operator, they'll tell you. Or it could be that these queries aren't coming from him, that they are coming from some other party spoofing that guy's, forging that guy's source IP address in order to get me to send this stream of packets. So what we did is we came up with a low memory, low CPU, high confidence algorithm that allowed an authority server to look at its request flows keep a very lightweight record of those request flows and start to behave unreliably in the face of repeated queries by the same net block for the same piece of data. 
Um, now, the devil is in the details, and there's a URL on my final slide that explains those details. We're very proud of them. I'm not going to go into it here, except to say that um, we, we were working on this during a time when a lot of these attacks were occurring. And I mentioned... Um, cool. Um, I mentioned on some DNS-related mailing list, by the way, we have a patch that seeks to solve this problem. And somebody who was having the problem said, okay, we need that patch. And I said, no, you don't understand. This patch, the confidence level I have in this patch is that I run it on my laptop in a, a, a Linux virtual machine, and my laptop has not caught fire. That's all I can tell you about this patch. And he said, well, okay, so maybe I don't want the patch because we've got to go through QA for six months and so forth, so there's no way we, we could d deploy that patch anyway. And so we agreed that that was the right way forward. And two hours later, they called back. They said, give us the patch. Give us the patch now. How many cases of scotch can I send to you, and what is your address? I need the patch. By, by the way, did I mention please send me the patch? This was Affilius. They are the operator of the .info server. And if you look closely at this chart, you'll see that they are using a graphical dodge here where the, uh, the data below the zero line is query traffic. The data above the zero line is their response traffic. So you'll see that throughout this graph, they were getting between 150 and 250 megabits of query traffic. And they knew that was wrong, by the way. They, they, know, their, their, they know their job. They know their business. They know what their characteristic load is. They knew that most of that was attack traffic. And part of the reason they knew is that they were sending back between one and two, two and a quarter gigabits of response traffic. They also knew that something was wrong because they were getting a lot of complaints. People were calling them and saying, would you please stop DDoSing us? So you can see what time on Thursday they installed our patch. And I have not been able to buy my own beer at any IETF or ICANN meeting where a... a uh, Affilius employee is present since then. They are extremely happy. And I, I believe that all the TLDs have something like this now. Um, I would go further. It started out as a bind thing, but it's now in NSD. So if you prefer NSD, it has this logic. The Cannot service from uh, CZNIC has this service. Nominum, I think, even has something like this. So let me just say, if you're running an authority server and it has not yet been abused, you probably just don't know how often it's abused. And you should investigate RRL, response rate limiting. OK, I mentioned that domain names are too cheap to meter. Uh, let me talk about what we did. We in this room are to blame for this incrementalist approach. We've been teaching spammers how to be better spammers without ever costing them any money or time in jail or anything else. Uh, these half measures we do are terrible for us. So there was a time when Spam Assassin was extremely effective. It lasted about two weeks because any spam body that had a dotted quad in the body was known to be spam because real mail doesn't do that. Dotted quad is a literal IPv4 address. Um, and so everybody started patting each other on the back and saying, yeah, Spam Assassin has solved the spam problem. I'm not getting any more spam because I'm able to drop it on the, on, on the threshold. Life is great until week number four, where the bad guys said, you know, if I can't send mail with dotted quads in the body, I guess I better stop doing that. What do I need to do instead? Well, what I need is a domain name, and I need domain names that are too cheap to meter, that have bad who is, and so forth. So they created a market. We, who deployed Spam Assassin, created the current market. Um, it is now possible to buy a domain name and have it be globally reachable within 30 seconds of using your credit card. And I challenge any of you to tell me the legitimate business case for that. Why someone who is not a criminal, who does not intend to use that domain name in some kind of abuse, needs a 30-second turnaround. Because I can tell you that if you're creating a web property and you've spent a lot of time deciding what the content's going to look like, maybe writing some software and databases and everything else, you don't wait until the day you're going to launch and suddenly realize, oh my goodness, I forgot to buy the domain name I needed. No. So we have evolved an entire ecosystem whose purpose is to make crime easier. 
And we have started at the other end by telling, more or less telling the spammers exactly what they needed to do and exactly how they needed to evolve in order to continue to be successful. And I, I just want to say, I hate that. Could we please stop doing things that have no purpose except to make spammers stronger? This reminds me of overuse of antibiotics. So we can't prevent these names from coming into existence, uh, but we can sure take them down. The .tk people received so many takedown complaints, this is the Tokelo Islands, uh, because they run a URL shortening service for spammers. They got so many complaints and so many takedown requests that they created an API. And they offer the ability for security companies to just go kill .tk names. That way they don't have to answer the phone. And the reason they did this is because the more you kill, the more they sell. So it's in their advantage to have an API. They're, we're helping them build, uh, build total market volume. Why do we do stuff like this is what I keep asking. Um, anyway, this, this thing about incrementalism breeding better criminals is uh, a matter of some soul searching for all of us. Because if we wanted to create a full employment act for us and for people like us who will come after us, so that we would end up with half the world as criminals and the other half in making money is trying to stop that crime. We're on, the, we're on track. That's the trail we're on. That's where we're going to go. Unless we start thinking about ways that we cause criminals enough loss of money or enough loss of freedom that we begin to make that whole realm of human activity less attractive to them. Enough luxuring. If you can't stop it from being created and for whatever reason you can't take it down, there are now options for you. Um, so for example, we've been firewalling for a long time. Sometimes we say only this service or this server on this port number should be allowed to be reached from the outside. Sometimes we'll have additional rules that say if this long set of IP addresses is the source of a, of a request, I, I just want to re, re, reject that request. So. Um, I started a company called MAPS, M-A-P-S, it's spam spelled backward, it was the mail abuse prevention system. We were the first commercial spam, anti-spam company, um, which I later sold to pay the lawyers because it turned out what I was doing by stopping spam was illegal, whereas what they were doing by sending it was not. So note to self, consult lawyers in future. Um, but anyway, that kind of reputation system is in universal use. Nobody thinks that they can be on the internet without some kind of defensive product, and that defensive product looks more or less, if you get high enough up and see things at the abstraction layer, like a firewall. There is now a DNS firewall. I know because I created that before I left my nonprofit a few years ago. Um, and so you can now control how that recursive DNS server responds to certain queries. You can say that if, you know, I'll get to that in a moment, um, so that if you, don't, if you don't necessarily know what the IP address is in advance, so you can't put it into your edge firewall, you have other ways to respond to badness. But there's so much badness coming from so many different places, and the bad guys are so mobile, and their population is so large, that it is no longer possible for any network operator to watch their logs and determine what should be blocked. So we all subscribe to some kind of a external service, whether it's spam house, whether it's a commercial service, whatever it is, uh, in order to basically program our firewalls using reputation data that comes from outside of our networks. Um, and I guess, you know, pub sub is a great thing, publish and subscribe. Uh, the fact that it works at all at this scale is remarkable. Um, I will give you a short example about uh, response policy zones. That's the DNS firewall that I, I created. You can trigger things based on either the query name or what the response contains. You can say if the response contains an address that is in these net blocks, then uh, fail, uh, fail the DNS resolution. Uh, you can look, you, if you have a list of bad name server names, bad name server addresses, you can even list by client source address. If you know that a certain client is infected, uh, you can respond to all of their DNS queries using a certain lie. This is really cool. If you like lying about DNS, uh, I'm proud of what we created here. Your actions when you trigger on one of those things can be anything from synthesized non-existence, just tell whoever it is, sorry that doesn't exist, where what you mean is that it doesn't exist for you right now, even though the truth might be different, 
or you can send back an alias. Maybe you have a walled garden. You've got a, a web server accessible to your customers that says, hey, you just clicked on something you shouldn't have. Uh, click here to re receive a training video. There's a lot of different things you can do when you, when you trigger on something. So this is a very powerful capability. It is free. It is only in bind at the moment. Um, but it's coming to other stuff. Um, I know I'm way over time, so I want to put in a commercial pitch for myself. Uh, my company, Farsight Security, is not in the threat intelligence business. We don't have IOCs, um, and we don't sell a reputation system. On the other hand, we are a great source of truth, great source of data, great source of, of uh, something you can use for policy. And I'll give you the example of the newly observed domain list. Um, I subscribe to it at my house in the recursive server that my family has been subjected to all these decades. Um, and the result is that any name that has been created in the last 10 minutes does not work at my house. So just instead of 30 seconds, it's 10 minutes and 30 seconds. That's all it does. And because so many spammers create so many domains at zero cost to themselves, knowing they're going to be taken away in the first five minutes, many spam runs uh, use domain names that they're not even expecting to continue using ever again after 10 minutes. Which means if you just lengthen it from 30 seconds to 10 minutes plus 30 seconds, a lot of things don't work. You, you, you place yourself outside the target victim demographic. Uh, and this is the kind of cool stuff you can do once you have a publish subscribe methodology in a DNS firewall. So again, uh, RPZ is free, it's part of bind, it's unencumbered, uh, you should investigate it. Um, and it's really because we can't get uh, fast enough takedown and we can't keep the bad domains from being created at the far side that this becomes kind of a near, near side defense, something you do on your end. Um, in order to restore internet policy to what you think it should be, even if you wouldn't have a lot of luck trying to get ICANN to see it that way. Okay, last but not least. I mentioned that there were things that you could do with that passive DNS, uh, and in our, it, it, the, the reason that chart comes so easily to me is that uh, this is what we do, this is our main thing. And again, this is, there are free parts to this and there are commercial parts to this. So this is a little bit of a pitch, but it's also a little bit of an uh, explanation of all the free stuff that you have access to. What we're doing here is we have a passive DNS sensor. Again, it's above the layer where the PII exists, so there's no surveillance going on here. And we feed it into a cloud where we make that raw data available to academics at zero cost, nonprofits at low cost, or for-profits at reasonable commercial cost. But we also build certain uh, applications of our own, certain products, including this thing called the DNS database. Let me give you a four-slide overview of what you can do if you have a DNS database. Traditionally, if you're doing DNS forensics after an attack, what you can find out is what is the truth now during my investigation. And if the domain name has been taken down, there will be no truth for you to look at. So you won't know what was going on at the time of the attack. So the first thing that we offered with this database was history. The ability to know what data has been returned over the entire history of this name. So what you can see on this slide is that uh, my old vanity name, Vix.com, was put up for sale in, uh, I'm going to say, October of 2013. It is still for sale, by the way. Um, had I been a criminal, then the fact that I moved my name servers in this way would be very interesting to you as an investigator to find out what else was going on in my life at that time that caused me to change providers. Here's an example of doing a wildcard lookup. Traditionally, you would have to use um, zone transfer to receive all the records that are in a particular zone, and uh, you can't. Um, because most people don't allow zone transfers. Certainly criminals are not going to allow zone transfers. But in the immortal words of Florian Weimar, who invented passive DNS in his uh, master's thesis back in 2006 or so, uh, if, if I can't see the zone all at once, I will be happy to reconstruct it one response at a time. So the, the information that we are all leaking about all of our online information is going into databases like this all over the world. So what I've done here is to look for all names ending in .vix.com 
and then I limited it to just my Comcast business connection because, of course, there's an awful lot of other crud in my zone. Um, as a DNS hacker, I, I make a big mess at home. Um, here's an example of looking at something as a right side lookup. So if this Vixie guy were a criminal, you might be interested in knowing what other domain names use his mail server uh, to deliver their mail. Uh, this is also especially interesting if you start looking it up by name server on the right side. Find all of the other domain names, zone cuts, all the other zone cuts that have reference to certain name server. Uh, that trick would not work with me because I use the ISC name server which has two million things in it. So uh, I chose mail for this example. But again, this is a great pivot point. If you know a little bit about somebody, you can use a system like this to then learn a lot more about them. I was showing a friend at the FBI how clean their network was. Um, this, none of this has changed at all in the four years that we've been watching and keeping, keeping records. And I thought, this is great. And then I thought, you know, there's a bunch of adjacent names that uh, actually names that lead to adjacent addresses because you only have this one net block and you've used it for everything that you've tried to do. Now, most of us in this room, I hope, don't think that the FBI is a criminal, but if they were, we might be interested in what is this InfraGuard thing that you share a net block with. Uh, so again, it's a great pivot point. There's a tremendous amount of multidimensional pivoting that you can do in an investigation if you have a complete record of DNS that's completely indexed. If you are afraid of these examples because they are using DNS notation, please uh, set your, your fears aside. It's actually a JSON server. It's a RESTful JSON API. I happen to have written the client I've been showing you, and it happens to output things in DNS notation because that's what I like. Whereas if you were to write an application, you would, have, you would be looking at the thing at the bottom, not at the at, at thing in the middle here. So we're last slide before the bibliography. Let me say that um, the sensor, time's up. I get it. Uh, the sensor is um, open source, and you can install it and point it at yourself if you want. Frankly, a database that was only fed by one enterprise would not be very rich. So keeping track of all of the names you have looked up is not really going to help you very much. You need to have access to names that a lot of people have looked up. Um, and so, as a result, our API is uh, open, so there are several other DNS services that speak the same API that we created. Um, our database itself is quasi-commercial, so if you're a student or other academic user, it's probably free, although I need your advisor to tell me that they want you to have it. If, it's, if you're willing to run sensors for us, we'll give you a tremendous discount off of whatever the price would be. Um, and if you want to use it commercially, then that's basically uh, how I paid for my plane trip here. So here is my limited bibliography. I hope if you do nothing else that you will write down these URLs and look, at, look them up. The other thing I could hope for is if you um, talk to me after the break, or I'll be here the rest of the day. My flight out is at 10 p.m. Um, and although, although my time is up, I'm going to break a rule because of the power outages and say that if there are any questions this would be a great time to just rise up and shout them out. And you know that Katie will do it if you don't, so please stand up, ask me something cool. We were talking about uh, DNS amplification attacks, like how to prevent uh, DNS servers from amplification attacks. So previously I was working on implementing DNS servers. So implementing for an ISP as well as for a mobile service provider, so mainly packet core DNS. So the requirement was like uh, 2 lakhs QPS every year, it will be incremented. So in that kind of a scenario, we have put a cluster of uh, Linux servers completely hardened, having a firewall with access control uh, in the DNS uh, configuration, plus blacklist also we are configured, we are configured TSIG also. Uh, so like when we are increasing the capacity, there is a chance of a DDoS attack always coming up. So how, to, how we can incrementally... Like I'll keep on protecting the servers. Thank you. Um, I think I heard you say that you're doing rate limiting in your front-facing firewall in front of your load balanced cluster. Um, the root name servers generally do that also. And there is a problem, which is that 
um, duplicates can take a form that is detectable in a DNS-aware DNS rate limiter, but are not detectable by a packet-level rate limiter. So um, I advise, certainly take a look at your name server software. If it's uh, bind or NSD, you already have this feature. If it's not, then you might be able to get this feature implemented. Um, but I believe that, uh, let, let's imagine that a uh, the questions are coming from adjacent addresses because, of course, they're all spoofed, so you can spoof enough addresses adjacent to your victim that they all hurt your victim with the response. And the questions are not all for the same name. They are for different non-existent names, all sharing the same zone, but all getting negative answers. It turns out in DNSSEC that a negative answer is the largest thing you can send because it contains three crypto-authentic proofs. So. Um, I believe that a determined attacker using the configuration that you have could cause you to be a DDoS amplifier. And so you should investigate rate limiting. Um, that would also solve the actual question you asked, which is that since each server would be doing its own rate limiting, you could easily add capacity without ever creating a temporary window where you had not yet tuned your, your edge parameters. Yes, sir. So you were advocating for DNSSEC, uh, but you're anti-surveillance. Uh, and as it stands, the, the HTTPS model is kind of hinged on the CA cartel, uh, where you do have some amount of choice, but ultimately you basically get to choose your own devil. How do you resolve that with the fact that DNSSEC is hinged on a single set of keys? So um, I am... Um not a fan of the X509 certificate authority system. Um, there are something around 2,000 different CA root keys that are present in each browser. They're roughly the same on all the browsers. And roughly half of them belong to nation state actors, uh, the intelligence bureaus of those. Uh, and they just create shell companies that go into the CA business. And they do this uh, so that they can offer browsers a um, certificate for any given TCP session that that intelligence service would like to be able to, uh, to, to be the man in the middle, uh, they, they can offer certificates to both sides that will satisfy them. Um, I don't like that world very much, and I don't like the commercial side very much better because if you look back at Komodo and a whole bunch of other fairly well-funded commercial CAs, you'll see that incompetence runs rampant and that error theory and theory of large numbers means that doing this is a recipe for disaster. DNSSEC gives us the opportunity to make a new ball game, completely new rule set, where yes, we all trust a single root key that is held by ICANN. On the other hand, that key is never used or touched except when there are about 100 different witnesses inside of a bunker where they're pulling that key out to go sign something. So we kind of believe that that key is safe and that it's in public view for all intents and purposes. And what, if you're willing to trust the one root key that is held by ICANN, then you can adopt the DANE technology, D-A-N-E, uh, by which we can start to certify the SSL and TLS endpoints that we're talking to using DNSSEC lookups rather than by referring to one of these 2,000 or so corrupt, incompetent certificate authorities. So I think it's a step in the right direction, although I have a little bit of alarm around the idea that we're all going to trust one key, because we all know that someday something bad's gonna happen to that one key. Um, nevertheless, it's a, it'll be an improvement over the current state of affairs. And with that, I think I've used all of the extra time that those power outages granted me, and so again, I thank you for inviting me. I'll be here all day, and I'd love to continue these discussions. Thank you.